This is Arts Around Austin, the preview of upcoming concerts, museum exhibits, stage plays, and more. It's February 2023, and here are some of the stories we'll be covering. Our Texas State Parks celebrating their 100th anniversary this year, as seen not through the camera lens, but through the eyes of artists. Then, the remarkable life of Lady Bird Johnson, mementos on display at the LBJ Museum, and a rare look at the role she played in the lives of her grandchildren and great-grandchildren. And later, a classical musician appearing at an Austin concert this month who is helping us to rediscover a brilliant composer who was almost lost to history. All of that ahead on Arts Around Austin. Get away from the cities and witness the serenity and the grandeur of nature, Texas style. Our state's constantly changing landscapes, from Gulf Shore beaches to towering mountains to those gently rolling grasslands. Its tranquil rivers, massive lakes, dense forests, and winding trails. A natural Texas to be experienced and enjoyed in the 74 state parks located in every corner of that Lone Star map and in lots of places in between. Texas state parks are something to celebrate and this year a birthday celebration. The park system is 100 years old in 2023, a gift to the people of Texas and their neighbors from Governor Pat Neff who signed the law creating the Texas park system in 1923. If he saw a need to establish, you know, public spaces, public campgrounds. So as people were traveling across the state, especially to some of our more rural counties or rural areas of the state, they needed a place to stay. And we started, uh, he started the state parks board in 1923 so that we could start trying to get donations of land to help fulfill that need of having places for people to, to rest and camp out and, and stay as they're visiting the different areas of Texas. The Bullock Museum in Austin is celebrating the centennial of the Texas State Park System with an exhibit of paintings by artists from around the state. The opening of the exhibit last month drew the artists, as well as art lovers, parks officials, and the public, to view paintings, photos, and essays that will continue to be on display through April. Texas Parks and Wildlife Department commissioned 30 Texan artists to share their views of our parks, natural areas, and historic sites that make up the state park system. The selection of 34 paintings on view are as varied as the parks themselves. This woodpecker was pretty insistent on being part of the picture. Part of the Among the artists receiving a commission was North Texan Billy Hassel. He spends time enjoying the Dangerfield State Park, and on a recent visit there, he captured, in watercolor sketches, a moment in time with a persistent woodpecker. My girlfriend, Bibi, and she noticed uh, this woodpecker up in the tree that was kind of behind where I was sitting, and I could hear it tapping and she said listen look there's, there's a woodpecker up there and so i was thinking about what to make as a central image for the painting from those sketches to a completed painting an artist's view of just one of our state parks on a summer day with a woodpecker immortalized in oil paint i think if i can make people stop and think about um you know, a particular kind of bird or a, a particular habitat or, you know, a place, then maybe I've achieved something. 34 paintings, the visions of Texas artists who, like all of us, celebrate our system of state parks on its 100th anniversary.
A remarkable life, Lady Bird Johnson. So many words have been written about her, so many pictures still fresh in our memories of the White House years as First Lady when Lyndon Johnson served as our president. Her life on the LBJ Ranch, her status as an icon in the civic life of Austin, and her countless contributions to make our city and our country a prettier place. And for the next few months, you'll still have the opportunity to catch a special exhibit at the LBJ Presidential Library and Museum, celebrating the many facets of the life of Lady Bird. But this exhibit is a little different than what you might expect. Lady Bird Beyond the Wild Flowers tells a broader story of her impact on her family, the nation, and the world. It features letters, photographs, clothing, and artifacts that will be seen by the public for the first time. We'll learn more about Mrs. Johnson's childhood, her family, campaign efforts, skill as a businesswoman, and her role as a philanthropist. And although her story is well known by many, we are still learning more about her. She was such a real person. She was easy to talk to. She was approachable. Nicole Nugent Covert, the daughter of Lucy Johnson and Patrick Nugent, and the beloved granddaughter of Lady Bird. She was, she was an avid reader. I don't remember her necessarily reading to us, but she was, she was always, she always had her, you know, her nose was in a book. And, um, I will say that I was fortunate because my, my kids were raised in Austin too. And we used to live right down the street from her. And so my, we would always go by, we'd call them drive-bys and we would do drive-bys with my grandmother and I've got two kids and they would read to her. Now, granted, they were, you know, young, and so they would choose the books they'd want to read. And so John, I remember, would always want to read her. He loved Indians. And so he would love reading her books about Indians and then baseball. Not sure if she was as keen on the baseball books as he was, but um, it was just such a nice way to see my kids reciprocate so much of what she did. And then Claudia would, my Claudia, so my daughter's name is Claudia, uh, would always love to just read, you know, a treehouse book or or, you know, a princess book because, you know, the age that they were. And my grandmother just relished in their, um, in their presence, which just, you know, as a, as her granddaughter and then seeing with my children, it just made me, it just made me smile and know how special a relationship that she was able to have with them. One of the things that I think she instilled in all of her grandchildren was to pick a passion and be passionate about it. And so when I was younger, I was trying to really figure out what I wanted to do and where I wanted to volunteer or things like that. And she, she kind of took me aside and she's like, you don't have to do it all. If you focus on one thing, you'll better, you know, you'll better serve that um, organization and yourself. So what to remember most about the lady the grandkids called Nini? She wanted to leave this place a better place and she found it. And she truly did. And I, you know, I walk on the campus of the University of Texas and I see so many things that she touched and and I see her name on so many of the buildings as she was a regent for for six years. And I just I'm so appreciative of all of the things that she did in giving back to all of us without us really knowing. You know, we walk around Lady Bird Lake now, you know, growing up here it was Town Lake. And, you know, for years and years and years. They had asked if they could rename it and she said absolutely not and then she agreed upon her death that she would um that she would let the city rename it and it's a it's a it's a tribute to who she was and what she cared about and really the environment is what she cared most about but i have to say she was an incredible grandmother and touched the lives of hundreds and thousands if not millions of people So what does it take to be a great pianist? Practice, of course. A love for music? An early start with lessons? For Michelle Can, it is all of that, but there is something more. She says it takes a desire to express oneself and to share with others the gift of music. 
Ms. Ken will be in concert with the Austin Symphony Orchestra on February 17th and 18th, performing one of the best-loved classical pieces for piano and orchestra, the second piano concerto of the Russian composer Rachmaninoff. I swear he came up with some of the most beautiful melodies, you know, known to mankind in this concerto. The, the mix of beauty and intimacy and um, soulfulness, along with just absolute ferociousness, is just unmatched, you know, uh, with many other. So you need to worry a little less about how you would have done it at the beginning. Miss Can oh. serves on the piano faculty of the esteemed Curtis Institute of Music in Philadelphia. And when she's not teaching or concertizing, she pursues another goal. That is, to bring to light the music of a composer who was almost lost to history. She's on a mission to share the music of Florence Price with the world. So, you know, Florence Price was a really a child prodigy, and she was born in 1887 in Little Rock, Arkansas. And, um, you know, to be a Black American in Little Rock at this time was actually a time for growth and for um, growth in the Black community and, um, you know, a, a, and sort of a you know, focusing on education and opportunities were there. So um, she ended up being accepted at the age of 16 to attend the New England Conservatory of Music in Boston. And she got her degree, uh, well, double degrees in piano and organ in only three years. Um, so she was extremely intelligent and driven and everything. And uh, she eventually had made her way back down to Little Rock, um, you know, to work and start a family and such. And now we're talking about the 1920s. And, you know, the, the world had changed a lot from 1887 to 1920s in which there was already, uh, segregation was already making its, um, you know, uh, showing itself. She um, eventually moved on to go to Chicago. She ended up thriving there. I mean, she made history in 1932. She was the first uh, composer, a Black American woman composer, to have a piece performed by a major symphony. And the Chicago Symphony premiered her symphony number one. Even though she, you know, reached this milestone, that didn't mean everyone else decided to, um, you know, take her seriously. She never had her pieces performed by major orchestras in her lifetime. Others, other major orchestras. Um, she would write letters begging them to please program my music and they wouldn't. She speaks about her race and her gender um, as a handicap. She uses those words in a letter. So here we are decades later. Uh, 2009 is when suddenly they find music in an attic. I mean, oh my goodness, this old house. This was her old summer home. It was it was just abandoned. I mean, nobody was living in it for decades. In 2009, they see in the attic these boxes of old music and it was her name it was music she wrote that was never published that nobody had seen nobody could find i guess you can see that i really really love her i'm passionate about her and i'm passionate about sharing her fantastic beautiful music with the with the world <laughs>